Good evening, everyone. Anybody got a special prayer request tonight that you'd like to be remembered? Yes. Oh, my goodness. Hmm. Yeah, anybody else, please? Mm-hmm. Amen. Let's remember that, please. Anyone else? Yeah, go ahead. What? Amen. Amen. That's that's good. Go ahead, Brother Jim. Man, let's remember Sister Maggie. Anyone else? Hey Amen. I'll also remember, uh, I mentioned uh, Sunday, my youngest sister is, went through some tests, and uh, it's not looking too good right now, but I told her, I said, we'll be praying for you. And I said, I'm pretty sure that God can wipe away all this, whatever that you're dealing with. And then my oldest sister, uh, her mother-in-law passed away uh, yesterday, so let's we'll certainly remember them. Anybody else? Kathy. Amen. Let's remember Sister Kathy. Let's remember tonight's service, and uh, pray that Brother Bobby brings out the the lesson for us. So, anybody who want to, let's all come into the altar and let's take it before the Lord in prayer, please. We're going to pick up in Romans chapter 14, verse 9. Romans 14, verse 9. God is the Lord over the de- both of the dead and the living. All right, Romans 14, 9. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. What does that mean? God's still the ruler, is he not? Does he still not have dominion over the dead? Well, yeah, everybody said, yeah, and you're right. If he did not, how would it be possible if he didn't have rule and wasn't Lord over the dead, how could the dead rise again if he 
wasn't ruler over that. How could the dead body live and be transformed into a resurrected, glorified body just like unto his, the one they saw on Mount Transfiguration, if he wasn't the Lord of the dead? God is going to raise the dead bodies. God is also the Lord of the living, is he not? And you understand to be dead in Christ, only the body's dead, not the soul and the spirit. And so when the Bible says that he's Lord, he is Lord whether that body lays in the grave for one hour or a thousand years or a million years. But the Lord means he still has dominion. How do I know this? The devil, if he could have access, would do to, just, do you remember when he was disputing with Michael the archangel about where the body of Moses was buried? The devil wanted to take possession of Moses' body. God said, ain't none of your business where it is. Michael the archangel said, the Lord rebuke you. And if the devil, if it wasn't for God have been the Lord and having dominion over the dead body, what do you think that the devil would do with our bodies while they were laying in grave waiting on resurrection? So he, he Lord, he protects these bodies. Even if they disintegrate and go back into the dust, he still is Lord over that. Because God don't have to hunt for where we are when it's time for the resurrection. He knows exactly. But he's, that means to be Lord over it, that means he's the ruler. We're still under his dominion. One day he's going to raise us up again. So if you died saved, or if you're alive and saved when the resurrection, when the rapture takes place, he's Lord over both the dead and the living. And he's going to raise us up. You'll be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye if you're alive at the rapture. If you're not, you get to be the first ones to go to heaven. The graves are burst open. We'll be changed. Brand new body. Never get sick, never die. Just like unto his. Does it won't be the flesh and the blood that we're used to. It'll be one like Jesus. You can walk through a wall. You can instantly go from here to there. You'll know you'll have the mind of Christ. It's going to be great. But he's the Lord of both. And what does that mean? That means he's still connected. Did he not make a promise? I will never leave you nor forsake you. If he made that promise, does that mean that when we guard bodies die, this body dies, the soul and spirit separate, go into heaven? If he wasn't there still connected, how could he come and raise that same body? So he's still connected to us. He's never forsaken the dead body, has he? Because he said, hey, don't worry about it. He told Paul to write in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. He said, Paul, I've been to the cemeteries. I've seen the brokenness. What I want you to do is write and give the people hope. Just because we put someone in the casket in the grave and we go back and we separate that time, God's presence never leaves that person. God's always there. So he's still the Lord of the dead. He's still Lord of the living. Now, when we talk about dead, we're talking about the bodies. You've got a different type of dead, which has nothing to do with this particular verse. It's those who die lost. Their soul and spirit goes into hell. Their bodies goes to the ground just like a saved person's body does. But God's not connected to that body. God's not connected to that soul and spirit. They're separated from God. And the only time that that soul and spirit and body will ever be connected back with Jesus Christ is it the great white throne judgment? You know what that is. It's not the judgment seat of Christ. It's the great white throne judgment. It takes place at the end of the thousand-year reign. That's when every lost person in this entire planet from start to finish will stand before him. They'll kneel. They'll look at him eyeball to eyeball. They'll recognize and admit that you are the Christ, and he'll say for me, because every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess in this entire universe. You are the Christ. He'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. And so that body that was raised with the soul and the spirit that was in hell will go into the lake of fire with the devil and his angels. So where he's not the Lord over that dead, that's a whole separate dead. He's talking about those that die saved. All right, let's go to Romans chapter 15, verse number 8. This one here is going to be... A 
little complicated. But if it gets to where I can't explain it, I'll call on my good friend Jerry and he'll clear it up for you. It's on my mind. All right. He is the minister of the circumcision. Look at verse 15, or chapter 15, verse number 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Does anybody want to tackle that? All right, the circumcision, biologically and physically, we all know what it is, right? Let's just move on to the religious portion of that, would we? All right. Nod at me. Y'all Y'all going to have to get with the program. All right, the circumcision was a covenant, which is a heavenly agreement between God and man of the Abrahamic covenant. God determined, and I can't explain why, I don't know, but that all the male believers, now, it's all the Jews, that's the law. It was put in the Mosaic and the Levitical law. On the eighth day, you can find that in uh, Genesis chapter 17, verse 12. But you can also find Genesis chapter 18. It's a covenant that God made with Abraham, beginning with Isaac, that all the male believers, all the Jews but the Gentiles, if you remember when they left Egypt, it wasn't just the Jews, but they had Gentile believers that believed also from different nations. And he said that the covenant would be the agreement that if you were a believer in Yahweh, which was uh, Father God, they called him the Creator God, the God of the Hebrews, then all the males on the eighth day when they were born would be circumcised. And all the males before that, if you became a believer or follower in God, you would be circumcised. That was your physical agreement that you were a believer in Father God, the God of the Hebrews. So why would the Bible say, because if you've read the New Testament, if you read the writings of the Apostle Paul, he was all over the Galatians and the Corinthians about they were still trying to keep the law and, and faith in, in Jesus in the New Testament. The New Testament was you had faith in Jesus Christ, you were saved. You didn't keep the law in order to be saved. It was faith and believing in him, right? But now we got the Bible here in Romans that's saying he's the Lord or the minister of the circumcision. Why would the Bible say that about the Lord Jesus Christ? Number one, he was born a Jew, right? Did he himself not say, and does the Bible not say also, that he kept every jot and tittle of the law, didn't break a one commandment, ain't that right? Does the law not say, even if we ain't read it, but does the law not say that the covenant between the Jews, the believers, and God was to be circumcised? So Jesus was on the eighth day because they kept the law. Jesus did the same thing, but he was a minister saying that, number one, he was a Jew. Number two, he kept every bit of the law, every single one, the only man in history to ever do it. Nobody's ever done it before or after. And that's why I say he is a minister of the circumcision, which means as a Jewish man, he kept that part of the law as well. And the Bible says that he was according to the law. He was circumcised according to the law. But he kept the office of Messiah, which means as a Jewish Messiah, he fulfilled the law. That means he was the only human, and he was 100% human as well as 100% God. He was the only one that could keep the entirety of the law. That's why he is the minister of the circumcision because he was able to keep it and to keep all the law. That was simply one part of the law that he kept. So he kept the office of Messiah and born Jewish, he was circumcised under the law. So that's how he's the minister of that. Now, he kept that 
up, t- up until he went to the cross of Calvary. When he went to the cross of Calvary and paid the sin debt and shed his blood and died but rose that third day, salvation is not about keeping any part of the law. He has to make that clear. That simply means that he fulfilled the law as a Jewish man, as God, but once he fulfilled it, the law was done and over with. And that's where the Apostle Paul had kept writing to these New Testament Christians. They thought they still had to do the circumcision and believe by faith in Jesus Christ. But the Bible plainly tells us in the New Testament, it's not by keeping of the law, it's not by works, lest any man should boast, but it's a free gift of God, which means today... We don't follow that, whether you're Jewish or Gentile, it don't matter. We don't have to keep any of the law. It's all grace. It's all faith. So that's why he says that. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. He's known as the power of God. First Corinthians chapter one, verse 24. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. We'll do both of those in the same verse. Why they call him the power of God? He was the visible God that they had been praying to throughout the entire Old Testament. Nobody had ever seen the face of God outside of Adam and Eve. Moses, God stuck him in the cleft of the rock. The hinder parts came by. Moses glowed for days. But the Bible says plainly nobody could look on God and live. And so throughout the Old Testament, it was by faith, but it was, it was by prophets and priests and sacrifices and law that they understood and got a picture who God was but when Jesus Christ came in flesh and again in his public ministry did he not say if you've seen me you've seen God and when you look at the power of God God in the old testament he worked through prophets he worked through high priests he worked through sacrifices Going way back into the beginning of the Old Testament, he worked through things called Urim and Thummim. That simply means they were colored stones and rocks. Sometimes they glow, sometimes they were black and white. They decided uh, things uh, right and wrong in, in that effect. Sometimes you had to offer a sacrifice. Sometimes God would accept it, sometimes not. But when you get to the New Testament, everything about God that they had never seen but just believed in their mind they could, see it in the, they could see God in the flesh. So that's why he's the power of God, because God did not work with everybody like Jesus did. You know how fortunate and blessed we are that we all have access to God? That didn't happen in the Old Testament. God, I mean, it through thunderings and lightnings, through one man, prophet, and, and there was years that they were silent. God didn't deal with anybody. Nobody except a priest or a prophet had the authority to come before the presence of God for any reason. God just didn't associate with people. I mean, you get a person like Noah, you get somebody like Abraham, but they never saw him. God would speak to their mind, God would speak to them in a dream, God would speak to them in a vision, but when Jesus came... The God that they had worshipped and believed in for thousands of years, they could see him in the flesh. And he was the power. Why did he not raise the dead? Did he not cast out demons? Did he not heal every single disease? Could he not quiet the storms and the elements? Did everything in existence not obey his voice? That's the power of God, and they got to witness it. So what, what God did up on a mountain hid behind clouds and what God did uh, hid behind lightnings and thunderings, Jesus did where they could see it in full view. They saw him heal. They saw him cast out demons. They saw him calm the storms. His disciples saw him walk on water. They actually could see and, and view the power of Almighty God right there in the person of Jesus Christ. So when the Bible says that he is the power of God, what God in the Old Testament did not show, God in the New Testament did. 
Jesus was and still is God the Father's power of demonstration. That means whatever they needed God to do in their life on any circumstance, God did it through Jesus. And he still does, does he not? Because, listen, you've got God the Father, God the Son, and you've got God the Holy Ghost. They're the same God. Somehow or another, us Baptists has got it in our mind that one's a little greater than the other. No, they're all equal. They're all just as much God. You've got three persons. But you've got God the Father who is a spirit. You've got God the Holy Spirit who is a spirit. But you've got God... Jesus Christ who came in the flesh but now has a glorified resurrected body. And so the power of God through these miracles, through the wind and the waves, you tell me besides the, the apostle Peter for a few steps under the authority of God, who else can walk on water in the middle of a storm? Who else can say wind stop blowing and it stops? Who else can take a sick person, whether it's leprosy, an issue of blood, or lame for 38 years, or bowed over for 12, and just say, be gone, be healed, and it happened immediately? Who else could heal the blind like he did just at a spoken word or a touch? He is the power of God, and they got to see it. And from time to time, if you'll pay attention, and the more you surrender your life to Jesus Christ the more supernatural miracles you will get to see. Because you remember what's the difference, ain't we all saved? We're all saved, but not everybody's totally dedicated. How many got to see heaven opened up out of 12 disciples? How many got to go on top of a mountain and see heaven? How many got to see and talk with Moses and Elijah and see Jesus in his glorified body? Three. So you understand the closer you walk with him and the more you dedicate your life to him, the more of these things you'll get to see. Because I am absolutely, unequivocally, I still believe a thousand percent without any shred of doubt whatsoever that we still serve the same God that can still do what he always done. I believe he can still heal every disease. I believe he can save the lost. He has power over demons. I believe he can do and come to you and me when nobody else can. He's the power, he is the power of God. But he's also the wisdom of God. What is the, what is the beginning of wisdom? The fear of God. Fear is not the fear like you have of a rattlesnake or the fear you have of some big something or another. Fear is wisdom knowing of who God is and who you are. It just, it just breaks me in two whenever I hear people refer to him as J.C. or the old man upstairs or the big guy. If you'd ever really met him and understood who the Bible says our Savior is, you'd never refer to him that way. He's not street slang. He's the Son of God. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the Lamb of God, the Son of God, the only begotten. He's the Savior. He loved you and me in this world enough that he came in a body of flesh and suffered more than any other man ever did just so we'd have the opportunity to be saved. And so he is the wisdom of God and his word. If you want to know things about God and things about the Bible, if you want true wisdom, surrender your life to God, get in this book, and he'll give you more than you ever even knew existed. You'll learn more about God and yourself in this Bible than any other thing you could ever do. But the truth of it is we've got everything we need to achieve that, but people just don't put the effort. If you devote your life to God, God will open up things and you'll have a better understanding of who he really is. That's wisdom. Does God not even tell the future? You ever notice how these psychics, especially the California psychics, have kind of went away? You couldn't turn TV on ever, just about ever, show on TV would have call a psychic. 
And if the best thing you could ever hope for by talking to a psychic is your own yoga studio, that's a pretty bad, that ain't a whole lot to hope for. And when they said on TV that California has the best psychics, I can go along with that. <laughs> if you've ever been to California, you know what I'm talking about. So you understand the wisdom of God means God can tell the future. Did he not say before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew exactly who you were? Does he not also say that he knows the end from the beginning? Does he not also know everybody that's saved, everybody that's lost, and everybody that's going to be in heaven? Does he not see things a day, a year, a lifetime ahead of everything else, and he already knows it's going to happen? Does he not also know that what we're going to ask for before we ever ask it? Does the Bible not even say in there, he knows all things? All right, so that's wisdom. If you want wisdom, I've said this many times, people that call psychics. Here's the difference between Jesus and a psychic. A psychic will ask you who you are and what you want to know. Right? And they'll jabber a bunch of stuff out like Nostradamus and they think he's the greatest thing ever. No. Jesus Christ formed me in my mama's womb. Jesus knew me before he did that. Jesus knew my name. Jesus knew the day I'd get saved. Jesus knew my last breath before I drew my first breath. He knows my last step before I ever took my first step. Jesus knows the day he's going to call me home. He knows all things. How many times in the Gospels did we read that, that Jesus knowing all things before they ever said one word out loud, knew what they were thinking and answered them. You find that many times in the four Gospels. So that's wisdom. If I want to know something, I want to know from somebody that already knows it before I ever ask the question. And I want to go to the fellow that knows my name. We've met. He saved me. I pray to him. We talk. Not a psychic, but he knows all things. That's wisdom. And God can do something that psychics claim to do, but they can't do it. He can reveal the hidden things. Remember Joseph, the interpreter of dreams? You didn't even have to tell him the dream. He'd tell you what it meant. You remember studying that? That's pretty good. Where did he get his wisdom from? God. Has anybody in this church ever got an instinct that you knew something that was going to happen that day? You really didn't know exactly what it was, but you knew something that day? That's God revealing something hidden. He don't have to tell you exactly what it is, but you know to expect something. Sometimes, have you ever been in prayer? I mean, you've got a real desperate need. And when you say, by the time you say amen, you know God heard it and God's going to answer it. Sometimes we don't, but there's that time. That's when God has the wisdom of God. He reveals hidden things. What about 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30? He is righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Look at verse 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. What is righteousness? That is being able to stand before God without blame. Can we be honest tonight? Has any one of us ever lived a life good enough without the blood being applied to our life that we could stand before him and be accepted into heaven? So if we stand before him in his righteousness, we're acceptable. There's no sin. There's no spot, no blemish. Once we stand before him, all that stuff's gone. And it's without blame through him. Now, what's the best our own righteousness can do? Well, how does God look at our own righteousness? As filthy rags. That's a pretty descriptive, descriptive description 
when God explains it, the best you can do, Bobby, is like filthy rags before me. Because how does the Bible describe our clothed in righteousness? Without spot, without blemish, without wrinkle. As the driven snow. We will have robes so brightly white, Clorox would be ashamed. And it's not just for the robes. That is for our life and our body and our soul. That's our righteousness. But notice sanctification. What does the word sanctification mean? To be set apart. Does the Bible not say we're in this world, but we're not of this world? That means we're in it, but we've been set apart from this stuff. We can't be counted amongst the world. We're in it, but we're not of it. We're different. The Bible even says, and this is putting it kindly, that we are a peculiar people. I've met some peculiar people. I may have pastored one or two. But sanctification seems to me that we have been set apart. We've been made holy through the Lord Jesus Christ. That means we have been personally sanctified. What does that mean? That means when you get saved doesn't mean your whole family gets saved. It's an individual process. Everybody has to come before Christ and invite him into their heart. You can't get saved and say, yep, we're all good. No, we're not. Everybody has to go the same way, whether you be Jew or Gentile. It matters not. Everybody gets saved the same way. When I say the same way, there's a time Holy Ghost conviction sets in. You make the decision. You're going to invite Jesus into your heart. Nobody can do it for you. Now, mom and daddy can make you eat your broccoli, but they can't make you get saved. That's your own decision. So sanctification means we're set apart. But not only are we personally sanctified, but we're set apart from temptations. Who is it that we call on to give us strength not to be drawn away by our own lust and temptations? Jesus Christ. Can we do it on our own 100% of the time? If we did, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be in the problems where we've had the same sin beset us over and over and over and over. Have you ever noticed that somebody had tried to straighten up for a while, you know, this New Year's uh, resolution? Anybody ever made one? Has anybody ever actually kept one? No, you've not. And you know you ain't. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to work out. I'm going to go to church more. I'm going to, and on and on and on and on and on. And on. January ain't even over and you ain't done it. Ain't that right? This is, where is this the fasting up place, church? And all these things are going to be known like really during my bathroom renovation, who did the most work and who didn't. You're getting two different stories on this. But the truth's going to come out. It won't tonight, but it will sometime or another. Sanctification from temptations. The only source we got, church, is the power of God that we can call upon him. And when our strength is weak, his strength is strong. That's what he's talking about. We're set apart. We are not like the unsaved. The unsaved have to rely on some other thing. They rely on 12-step programs. They rely on different methods. And I'm not saying they don't work because sometimes they do. You got people who's never even met God and will tell you that's been sober and clean and, and did just fine. I'm not saying it ain't possible. I'm just saying on our own, we are no match for temptation, but with Jesus Christ, when we're weak, he's strong. And when we're weak is when we tend to go back to what God saved us out of anyway, ain't it true? Not only sanctification, but redemption. You know what redemption means? Anybody ever use coupons? Man, I don't. I want to. I have used extra bucks at CVS. 
saved thirteen dollars the last time, but I spent about forty. So hey, either way. But it's somehow or another me and coupons just do not get along. You got a coupon? No, I don't. Coupons is when you when you have something in your hand that's worth something, that you can get something for that. That means you have bought something back. When Jesus went to the cross, he bought us back from the devil. At the Garden of Eden, the devil thought he had us for good. But when Jesus went to the cross and paid the sin debt, and when Jesus rose from that third day, defeated death, hell, and the grave, Bob's back. So what's the day of redemption? We know what redemption is. That's to be bought back. What is the day of redemption? I've done said it a dozen times. The rapture. The day of redemption is when Jesus raptures the church, presents his church, his bride, to his heavenly Father, and says, these are those that thou hast given me. I've lost not a one. That means he bought us back at Calvary and he's now presenting us to his heavenly father. They're ours, all of them. Redemption means we've been pardoned from death. Were we not had? Y'all know the difference between the first death and the second death, right? Heads are nodding, so yeah, we'll go with that. That means we have been rescued from the pits of hell. Is that not when we were born where we were headed? But once we've been redeemed, we've been bought back. We belong to Jesus now. He bought us like at an auction block. He paid that price. That's how important we are. That's why I say live every day as close to the Lord as you can possibly get. You'll love it. The more, you, the more God reveals of himself to you, the more you want to see. Redemption. 2 Corinthians 2, chapter verse 8. Is he the Lord of glory? And did I say Second Corinthians? Well, don't go to, back to First Corinthians, chapter two. There's my first for the night. I'm too busy talking. I ain't got time to think. First Corinthians, chapter two, verse eight. See if this don't make more sense which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Lord of glory means that he's a glorious Lord, does it not? How did he become the Lord of glory? Number one, he came from glory, did he not? Everything in heaven glory, everything. Whether it be the angels, the throne, God, the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, all of heaven, all the creation, the streets of gold, the twelve foundations, all of it's glorious. But does he not dwell in glory? Not only that, in his outward appearance when he came as a, in a body of flesh, on the outside was flesh, right? So how could he be 100% God and 100% flesh? Because on the outside you saw a body of flesh. On the inside he was still glory. He was deity. When he went to the cross, he had to will himself and lay his life down. They couldn't take it. God can't die. Glory cannot die. And so he came from glory. He dwells in glory. His outward flesh, but his inward was glory. Does he not have the same nature as his heavenly father? I and my father are the same. He said it. They have his father. Their nature is the same, right? They're both glorious. Not only is their nature the same, but their name is the same. They're both God. Jesus is just as much God as God the Father and God the Holy Ghost. But not only that, but they have the same will. 
did Jesus not say many times in the New Testament and the four Gospels, did he not say, my meat, which is what I live for, is to do my Father's will? That means the will of his Father became the will of Jesus Christ, and their will is the same. That's why he's the Lord of glory. Does the Bible not say that they've got the same glory? Well, who's the Bible say in the new Jerusalem and in the new, in the new city, which is the new Jerusalem, there's no need for the S-U-N because the Son of God, his glory is all the light that the, the heaven needs. So that's glory, is it not? Listen, when he came in a body of flesh, even as a baby, even on the cross, he was still just as much glory, beaten and bloody as he was. He still had the same glory. The world couldn't see it, but I can promise you his heavenly father did. And I'll tell you something else. I believe the devil recognized that he still had his glory. Death recognized he had his glory. So he is the Lord of glory. That means his eternal glory is eternal, and that also means of his brightness. He's, he is also the king of glory, which means he triumphs over paganism. Here's something I want you to get, get, have a thought about. Well, I, just, I mentioned a, while, a little bit ago about the great white throne judgment, did I not? Imagine the look on these people's faces that worship Buddha and Muhammad and Allah and all these other false gods when they're standing in line and the God that they believed in was false, a pagan God, and Jesus said, depart from me, I never knew you. They'll know it's over them. And no matter how many times we tell them we serve the only true risen and living God there is, some people are just not going to believe. But I promise you they'll know it without a doubt at the great white throne judgment. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 11. He's our foundation. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Bible says he's our cornerstone, does he not? Listen, I'm not a block layer, I'm not a brick layer. But I have learned from going to church with a brick layer. Everything about a foundation starts with the cornerstone. If it ain't exact, you can't run a straight line nowhere. Jesus is the cornerstone. What is so important about the foundation? You better get this because I preached on it about three weeks ago. Everything is built on the foundation. The foundation supports this building. The foundation supports us being in this building. The foundation supports the walls, the roof, the, the pews, this up here. The foundation has to be strong enough to support everything that steps and depends upon it. The foundation has to stand in the storm, has to stand uh, during earthquakes, has to stand everything. And if you'll notice, one of the first things to go in an earthquake is the foundation because everything crumbles. Foundation's gone. But look at how the world's tried to destroy the church, the New Testament church, for over 2,000 years, and we're still standing on a firm foundation. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, he ain't old, he ain't hit crippled up, he ain't worried about nothing. So we, on, we're built on a foundation. The church is built on the foundation, which is Jesus Christ, right? The foundation means that it was established before you could build anything. Do you not first have to lay a firm foundation first? And if it ain't right, it'll crack before you ever get the entire structure built, will it not? And if it's a week and it doesn't, it looks good, but it ain't never been tested by any storms of life, you're going to find that, especially during bad construction, when the bad things happen, the foundation gives out and you can see it collapse. You can see it crack. How many's ever seen foundations crack and your walls crack and your doors won't open and close and Kathy's got her hand raised up in there. I've been in her basement. It was coming in on her and the foundation was cracked and the walls had moved about that much. And, <clears throat> and when you got a foundation crack, it begins to show. 
Now, you may not see the foundation itself, but when you see cracks begin to, begin to form, if you want to see some real foundation problems, go in the red, white, and blue room. It's separated that much. It's sinking. We're going to have a basement. But you'll know that no matter what happens, if your walls don't crack and it don't begin to sink, that whatever you're built on will withstand everything that comes its way because without the foundation, nothing else stands. So he is our foundation, is he not? He's established. He is our doctrine. Isn't it good to know that we don't have to make up our own doctrine as we go along? It's already here. We know what we believe. Faith stands on it. What about 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 7? Is Christ not our Passover? All right, let's read it. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Now, we all know about the field, uh, the, the bread they ate, that, that last meal. Leaven and unleavened. Leaven, have anybody ever made homemade bread? You put that yeast in it? I only did it the one time, and the ladies, when I pastored up the valley, said, here, it's different than anything you'll ever buy out of the store. I said, fine. It sat there in the kitchen hours and hours, and they called me about five, six hours later. Hey, you like that bread? I said, I don't know. It's still sitting in the pan. We'll set it outside in the sun. I did that, and it wasn't no time. It runs up out of there, and it's out of the pan and on the picnic table. What I'm saying is it takes time to raise up and do its work. And the Passover meal was, we ain't got time for all that. Just eat it without the yeast in it. Just eat the unleavened bread. But the, him being the Passover is way more than that. Him being the Passover means, you remember when they killed the lamb? Everybody had, had the blood splattered from the doorpost. The death angel could not pass. Had to keep going. Had to pass, but could not come in. That's exactly what Jesus did. He's our Passover lamb because we just, did he not say he was the God of the dead and the living? Well, we never have to worry about death. And you're saying, but yeah, but people die every day. Their bodies do. But the body that dies ain't going to heaven with us anyway. If you want to know the truth, this body and this mind's the biggest hindrance you and I got. And the older you get, the more you're going to find that your day is going to, to the doctors and the pharmacy. I mean, back when we were younger, Janice and I would go out on dates. Now it's just a trip to the doctor. And if she's good, it's Cracker Barrel on the way home. But that's life, is it not? It requires more maintenance. Our body can't do what they once did. They begin to die slowly. And you see, the Passover is, this body ain't going anyway. But the Passover lamb means because Jesus is our Passover lamb, he's the lamb of God, he's the sacrificial lamb, he died so that you and I never will die. You know that, right? This body, listen, let it go. So in spirit, the who we really are in Jesus is what goes to heaven. And at the rapture, the new body catches up with us. So he's our, he's our sacrificial lamb. He died for us. He didn't need to die. He didn't need his sins forgiven. He never sinned. He's sinless. But we were not. And so Jesus died in our place, paid the sin debt for us by his blood, which means he took our place. But let's go move on. He is also our spiritual rock. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. This will probably be our last one. That spiritual rock. Verse 
And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Do y'all remember all the Hebrews leaving Egypt and traveling 40 years throughout the wilderness? Y'all remember that? When they got really bad thirsty, what did God do? Told Moses, strike the rock, did he not? What came forth out of a rock? Water. For over two, two and a half million people. But what was the difference that, between Moses' rock and Christ being the rock? Two big differences. Notice one, that this that says at the bottom of verse 4, the rock that followed them. Now, did Moses' rock follow them through the desert? Did they not have to go a second time, which is what got Moses in trouble with God? He said, speak to the rock the second time, but he, he was done mad, and he struck it, and God said, you ain't going into the promised land. Here's what, here's what Jesus, Jesus is the spiritual fountain that gives us eternal life that goes everywhere we do. Moses' rock was in one place, and once they drank and move on, that rock stayed there. It didn't help them ever again. They'd go to a, rock, a different rock a second time. What did Jesus tell the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well? Give me to drink. She couldn't understand that a Jewish man would ask her help for anything. But he did say, I can give you a drink of living water that if you drink, you'll never thirst again. The rock of Jesus followed, went all the way to Samaria where a Jew did not go just to offer her a drink of living water. So the difference between our rock, Jesus, he goes wherever we do. There's never a time that Jesus cannot or will not pour out of himself to us. Listen, when we get saved, that ain't the last drink we ever take. We have to take it when we want to be infilled with the Holy Spirit. Again, now, not we're saved, but an infilling of the Holy Spirit means that God gives us another work of the Holy Spirit that strengthens us to accomplish something that we have before us. That's an infilling of the Holy Spirit. You get the gift of the Holy Spirit when you get saved, but that infilling means God gives us something to help us through a, a trying time. How many how many's ever in here ever asked God, God, I need strength for this, what I'm facing. I can't do it alone. That's another infilling of the Holy Spirit. That's God giving you another source of strength that you did not have at the time that you need. That's taking another drink up from the rock that follows us wherever we go. He, he says this, that spiritual rock. His water is eternal, was it not? Or is it not? Which means his fountain never runs dry. Don't you all believe that whenever whatever it is that we stand in need of, Christ can meet that very need? Has anybody in here ever been real weak? You're facing something, you've been dealing with something for a while, and you're just tired of fighting, and you just, I mean, you're just over it? But you know you can't give up, but you know you can't go on with the strength you've got. You're saying, God, I just need a touch. That's another drink of that spiritual water. You may get it through prayer. You may get it through crying out. God may just give it to you. But we all stand in need of it because we've got to have another drink, not for the salvation, but for the strength, for the encouragement to go on for not being able to give up. Sometimes we just have to face something, and I don't know about you, but if you've ever tried to face something, you'd rather just not, but you know you got no choice. You can't face what it is you're facing alone. You need God. That's what that spiritual rock is. That's also given supernatural divine favor. I know that Baptists like to steer clear of that, thinking, well, we're, that's a charismatic phrase, but it is not. God does supernatural things. God is spiritual, is he not? God gives us divine favor, doesn't he? Listen, if you're saved and you think the, if you, you think the only last supernatural event ever happened in your life is your salvation and God's done to you, you better think again. 
I mean, there, we're going to face our Goliaths at, from time to time in our life. So he is our spiritual rock. He goes where we go. Anybody got any questions? Any comments? Absolutely. Absolutely. God uses people. God will give angels. You may not ever see them, but he puts angels in charge of us. Yeah. And he can put a person in your life, and you've got no clue what the real reason is they're in your life at that particular time, but God's placed them there. There you go. Yeah. That's. There you are. Oh, you be yeah, without doubt, Denise. Without doubt. And how many times has we may have entertained angels unawares that we didn't realize that they took on human form that we didn't know it was an angel. Yeah. I mean, I done told y'all about that time, my experience up in Bristol, Virginia, with, with, with I had no doubt he was an angel. I come out, of, get out of my truck, I'm the only one in the parking lot. I'll tell you again, because you may have done forgot it. If not, we still got a minute. I'm the only one in the parking lot. I circle the store, I'm in uh, Bristol, Virginia. I climb out of my truck, and I can see the whole parking lot on that end of the store. I get out of that, I get out of that truck, and as soon as I turn around to close the door, there's a guy standing right in front of me with a suitcase. An old man looks like he was in his mid-50s, late-50s, white-haired. He said, buddy, he said, I've got a coat I'd like to sell you for some money. He said, I'm hungry. I ain't got nothing to eat, no money. I said, buddy, just go ahead and keep your, keep your coat. I'll just give you the money. And I gave him money to eat on and gave him some food. All I did was just shut the door and turn around, and he's gone. And I'm still the only one in the parking lot. Now, there ain't no human could disappear and appear like that. And there was a tree line. He didn't have, he didn't have time to get to the end of the trailer, much less out of sight. So I'm convinced that was an angel God put just to see if I would be compassionate or not. Would I look at him as a bum or would I look at him as somebody I could help? So I gave him money, food. He disappeared. I've heard testimonies of people in car wrecks where angels had come in the car with them and kept them company. There you are. God puts... And the angels here on earth were sent for our protection. All right. Are we ready to go? Uh, I'm thinking Sunday morning, 10 o'clock for Sunday school.